Come on, join us. We're going to carry on with our teaching. Well, last week I began with uh, talking about some vineyard roots, or if you want to call them vineyard distinctives, and this uh, grew out of us reporting on the Lead On conference that uh, a number of us were at a few weeks ago, and uh, these were talked about, and I just felt that it would be helpful just because of the feedback I heard from different ones that different ones of us that went in terms of how helpful we found that uh, we felt it would be helpful just to go through these here on a Sunday morning. Like I mentioned last week, I said, you know what, all of us, uh, or no, let me, let me back up. <laughs> I, I used the analogy of a, of a car, and I said, any car uh, needs a tune-up at some point. Even if it's properly taken care of and everything else, uh, every car needs a tune-up at some point. And I said, we are very similar We just need to be adjusted once in a while in terms of here's the things that matter, here's the things that we believe are are especially important, and so uh, we're going to be going through these things just as a way of asking ourselves, okay, do we need to tweak some things here? And uh, we've we've called these vineyard roots or vineyard distinctives. At the same time, many churches would say, yeah, those things are really important. (laughs) So... It's just things that we really have felt to emphasize. Let me just go through the six that I, that I talked about last week. There's 12 that we're talking about all together. I'm going to go through the first six as a review, and then uh, I'll talk about uh, the last six. So last time we said the first thing was keep to the main and the plain. And we talked about how we have this tendency at different points to major on the obscure or to focus on the obscure. And and we said it is so important. Yes, we can look at those obscure things sometimes in Scripture and try to figure out what does that verse really mean. Um, But our energy really needs to go into the things that we know God has clearly said. And last week we talked about, you know, Jesus really narrowed it down to two commands. Love God love people. (laughs) If you're doing those things, guess what? You're doing what he's called you to do. And and, uh, um, we need to continually remind ourselves not to get sidetracked with our time and our energy. Let's put our time and energy into those things that we know he has spoken. Second thing we talked about last week was the kingdom of God or the rule of God or God having his way uh, among people. The kingdom of God has come. Jesus brought the kingdom when he came to this earth to represent the Father and to show us what he's like. Yes, we will only see the totality of that once Jesus returns. We totally believe that. At the same time, Jesus taught us to pray, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it's being done in heaven. And so we're to continually seek to see more of that happen all around us in the places where God's placed us, in the relationships that he's put us into. And, and uh, one of the things that Jesus said to his disciples, uh, to the 12, also to the 72, at one point he sent them out and he said, go heal the sick and tell them the kingdom of God is near. And I won't get into all the details of that, but last week I said, well, What does that look like for us? And I I suggested that it could look like us going to people wherever we are in this past week and say, hey, is there something that I can pray for for you? And with that, in in language that people would understand to say the kingdom of God is near you, or we said um, it, it could be something like God is on the move, God's doing stuff, God's here. And so about three quarters of you put up your hand and said, hey, I want to aim to do that in some way in this coming week. So now I'm going to ask you how many of you had opportunity to do that. So if you had, if you had opportunity to do that, put your hands up. Awesome, a bunch of you did. Any, any stories out of that? In real short, uh, stories of, of you going and doing that. Something that you saw God do. Still got to find out. Okay. 
I don't know what happened to mine either. I, I had opportunity for a couple of different situations to do exactly that, and I have to go back now and, okay, so what happened, right? <laughs> um, anyways, a number of you did. That's awesome, and I just really want to encourage us to continue to do that. This wasn't just a project, okay? Uh, this is something that we want to live in. Okay, how, how do we do this thing that, that Jesus clearly told the disciples to do in terms of announcing the kingdom and demonstrating the kingdom? The third thing we talked about was a prayer. Come, Holy Spirit. And without getting into detail, it's right for us to continue to ask for more of him. More of him having his way in our lives, in our situations. Fourthly, we talked about being worshipers of God. By the way, these are all in quotations, those of you that weren't here, because these are things that John Wimber emphasized to us, who is our leader for many years, has since gone to be with the Lord. Um, But we're worshipers of God, and we talked this morning about abandoning ourselves in worship to God. Let it be true connection, not just on a head level, on a true heart level, And obviously not just here, but wherever we are. We talked about being rescuers of men and women. Whatever language we want to use, we're in the business, if you want to call it it that, of wanting to see people rescued, brought from darkness to light. Wanting to see people uh, come to the place of finding life in Jesus Christ. And sixthly, Everyone can play. We're all ministers. Yes, on a Sunday morning, there's some of us that are doing the stuff up here, but it's one reason why we do the the coffee break. It's another reason why we continually encourage us as we come together, be listening for what God would want to say through you to someone else, or who would God have you go pray for, or who would God have you connect with, or who would God have you say, hey, let's go do lunch together. Um, But we can all play. We can all be used by God uh, to serve others. So, I want to talk about uh, six others uh, today. Number seven, come as you are. Some of you were pretty messed up when you first came here. <laughs> Some of you are still pretty messed up. <laughs> and we're glad you're here. That's what we're about. Jesus didn't tell people to get cleaned up before they came to him. And I'm just going to give a number of examples out of Scripture. Uh, John chapter 8 uh, talks about the woman who was caught in adultery, religious leaders, I don't know what that looked like, but somehow, um, brought her, don't know what happened to the guy, uh, brought her to Jesus. You know the whole story, I'm not going to go through all that. But Jesus' response to her is, I don't condemn you. Very interesting. They figured, let's bring him to Jesus. Jesus is really going to let her have it. Jesus is like, I don't condemn you. And his actions conveyed love to her rather than judgment and rejection. But then Jesus did say to her, go now and leave your life of sin. And the thing that we see with Jesus over and over, Jesus totally embraced all kinds of different people in whatever state they came to him in, but then he also called them to life. (laughs) Okay, You don't have to stay this way. You don't have to keep living that way. You now can live this way. No one needs to get cleaned up in order to come to church. We want to be a church that embraces people in the middle of whatever they're going through. Jesus at different points was called a friend of sinners because that's what people observed. Wherever he went, he found the people that were going through all kinds of stuff and he embraced them. He went to the lepers who people stayed away from and he healed them. He interacted with and brought life to the Samaritan woman who had been married five times and was on man number six. And Jesus showed how he really cared about her and loved her where she was at. And most of you know the story of of where that ended up. And so this whole thing of, of, of wanting people to not just come here, we're not just about 
coming to church. We're about being the church. And it's about how we embrace people and how we want to see people uh, begin to connect with Jesus. It's not about people finally getting their act together, first of all. But there's a power at work, and that is to see people actually changed and to see people brought to new life. Now, the other thing I want to say is this distinctive, if you want to call it that, has also affected our dress in the vineyard. Not to say that we shouldn't dress appropriately with cleanliness and proper hygiene as we do in all of life, but there's something that I think can be conveyed negatively if we think that we need to get all dressed up for church in a way that we don't dress for the rest of life. I can remember when I had the thought of becoming a pastor, I used to think, does that mean I have to wear a suit all the time? You know? So fortunately, you know, we started the church and I was able to decide what we're going to look like. (laughs) But if we have the attitude of, I need to really dress up for church, we can in some way convey the idea that we're becoming something different in order to come together and talk about Jesus and worship God. And then when we get home, now I can get rid of those clothes and carry on with normal life. In reality, what we're wanting to convey continually is this thing that we're doing here is normal life. This is how we live. This is how we want to live 24-7. And so, like I said, we want to, we want to convey the, the whole thing of let's be the church wherever we are. And let's, let's function as the church when we come together here. Number eight, naturally supernatural. We totally believe that all of us can be used by God to see his supernatural power function through us to bring healing, to bring restoration, to bring freedom to other people. And, and if there's anything that I think we need to call each other to in this regard is for all of us to have an expectation that God will use each of us, every one of us, to do this in other people's lives. Some of us are reading a book by Richard Foster right now, older book, classic really, uh, called Celebration of Discipline. And he talks about the, the spiritual disciplines and goes through 12 different things. Interesting, the one that he talks about in prayer, and this was written, the, the, the edition we're reading, I believe it was written in 88, which is not that long ago, but kind of just when computers were getting going. He said he took, just, just for his own use, he took a Bible at one point and cut out all the scriptures that talked about prayer. <laughs> Could do that with a computer now, a lot easier. But he actually cut them out of a Bible and pasted them on a sheet, on sheets of paper, so that he could read everything that the Bible said about prayer in one sitting. And when he did this, he was blown away with what God says about prayer. And he realized that that God promises to do way more through prayer than we often expect him to do. And he said as a result of reading that, he had such a heightened expectation of of what God would do through him. And he he presents this challenge. In, In essence, he says, if we are not seeing regular answers to prayer, in other words, God regularly doing the things that we are asking that he would do, he says, if we're not seeing those things, we're praying wrong. We're praying wrong. And I thought, wow, what a, what a strong statement. And I, just out of that, just did some of my own reading this past week, um, just my regular reading came across some stuff that, that Jesus has to say about prayer. And Jesus makes these promises. In fact, I, I kind of look back and, did he really say this? He says, ask whatever you wish. <laughs> did you say Wish? Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. 
And so, obviously we could spend a whole morning just talking about this. But this whole thing of naturally supernatural, I'm talking about the supernatural part here first. God intends that through his people, his supernatural work is evident. As we're, as we're going out and doing, which a number of you did this past week, you went around, okay, who, who is there that I could pray for? God's intention is that we would be used by him to actually see God come and heal and set free and restore and help in some supernatural way in people's lives. And so if there's, if there's something that I think God wants to do is heighten our expectation. The, 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 the interesting thing is there's something about us having expectation. <laughs> if, we, if we have this inner stirring of God's going to do something, there's, there's that element of faith. It's not something that we try to get going. But there's something within us when, when God does that, God responds to that kind of expectancy. And so I just want to call us in this whole area of, you guys, you know, this is something we've said over and over again, this thing of being naturally supernatural, but sometimes we just major on the being natural. <laughs> Let's be supernatural, okay? Um, but we are committed to doing this in normal, natural ways. I know when I was introduced to the ministry of the Spirit, it came in packages that I kind of found hard to swallow. <laughs> uh, packages that I couldn't relate to. I don't think Jesus got all hyped up when he went and healed the sick. I think he went and healed the sick. I believe he took authority. But it's interesting, if someone knows their authority, they can just speak it. And they don't have to shout it, or they don't have to somehow manipulate something to get it to happen. Jesus knew his authority, and God wants us to function with that kind of natural confidence. One of the interesting things uh, that John Wimber used to do in the various conference settings that I was in where, where he was leading these when we, we came to prayer time, he would tell people if he, if he sensed this kind of rising uh, human energy, try to get things going, he would just dial down, just relax. <laughs> With the understanding that that stuff that we try to get going actually inhibits God rather than actually letting God do what he wants to do. It's really, we are really conduits of the Holy Spirit. In many ways, this uh, distinctive, if you want to call it that, uh, grows more out of the story of the Gospels than out of specific commands. But in some ways, what we're talking about could be described as without pretense. In other words, not putting something else on. A couple of scriptures that mention that, 1 Peter 2, verse 1 in the message says, So, clean house, make a clean sweep of malice and pretense. Envy and hurtful talk. And Ephesians 4.25 says, What this adds up to then is this, No more lies, no more pretense. The NIV uses the word hypocrisy. And Jesus often talked about hypocrisy. In other words, being something on the outside that we're not really on the inside. I remember a fellow that we had come, uh, had come speak in a previous church that I was in, and he was one of these dynamic speakers, and he was up here and shouting and hollering and doing all this stuff. And I was like, whoa, okay. You know? um, he was bouncing all over the stage. And, and then we ended up having lunch with him, and I realized he was a completely different person. And I was completely taken aback. Whoa, this guy is not the same guy there as he is here. <laughs> and so God calls us to be people who are without pretense, without hypocrisy. But like I said, when it comes to functioning with God's power, doesn't mean we don't function with his authority. Doesn't mean we don't function with expectation of, of what God wants to do. And so I just really want to encourage us uh, in this whole area.
Number nine, equipping the saints. We actually had a magazine called that for a number of years uh, in the vineyard, put, up, put out by uh, the U.S. Actually, that was when we were still all connected uh, without separate nations. Um, and it really grew out of Ephesians chapter 4, 11, and 12, where it says that God gave leadership gifts to the church to equip his people for the works of service, or other translations say, to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. We want to be a church full of people, like I've already alluded to, where we all recognize that God's given us things with which we can serve others, and we want to do all that we can to continually train and equip each other to actually be able to do that. When I first went to a large vineyard conference, actually Louise and I, back in 1985, there was so much we loved about what we were seeing, and theologically... I was already in agreement with what I was hearing. But what I realized was here's people who are doing it, not just talking about it. <laughs> Interesting. I remember, you know, prior to that, I can remember teaching a, a, a course on spiritual gifts. We didn't do them. We just talked about them. <laughs> and suddenly I encountered some people who weren't just talking about it, but actually doing it. And so our goal as a church continually is to be equipping each other to actually doing it. One of the difficulties is some of us don't think we need any more equipping. <laughs> I, got, I got it down. I'm fine. You know, don't bug me. <laughs> so I just, I just wrote out a number of questions, and obviously we could, we could have a whole bunch more. Um, but... Maybe some of these will, will give rise to a little bit of a sense of, hmm, maybe I need to learn some more things. If you were out for lunch today and God prompted you to share your faith with your server, would you know what to do? I feel like asking. Yes, no. Um, you guys want to put up your hands? How many of you would say yes? How many would say no? How many would say kind of? <laughs> How many aren't sure? <laughs> okay, if they wanted to become a Christian, would you know how to lead them to doing that? I've had, I've had people come to me, hey, so-and-so I think wants to become a Christian. Can you, can you lead them to Christ? I said, no, you do it. We're all into this thing, guys. So would you know what to do? If someone came to you, if a, if a fellow co-worker came to you this week and said, hey, I, I, I've, I've, I've found out about being a Christian. Like, I want to become one. What do I do? Are you able to lead them in that? Are you able to pray with some effectiveness in seeing sick people healed? i.e., have you seen a number of people healed as you've prayed for them? Now, some, some might say, well, it's not my job to heal them, so it doesn't matter if people have been healed or not. Related to the things that I said before, I believe that God intends to use our prayers to actually do what we're praying for. And so if we're praying with effectiveness, I believe we will see results. And I believe that everyone who prays for the sick, for example... If you're doing it with any amount of regularity, you are going to see sick people healed. In reality, every one of us in this room right now should be able to pray for the sick and we should be able to see a number of people healed. I'm not, I'm not saying it's up to us. I'm just saying God's chosen to use us as conduits for that. And so I believe it's right for us to ask. So are you, I'm not going to ask you to put your, hand, put your hands up. Um, but it's right for us to ask, are you able to pray with some effectiveness? And, and if, if the answer is, hmm, not so sure, then I would say, you know what? We, we do courses at different points that want to train us how to do this. Now, then it, it, it comes down to doing it. Um, but I believe that, that we can be trained in terms of how to do this uh, in a way that we actually see God do the things that he wants to do. Part of that is listening to God's voice. And that's another thing I would say, have you learned to listen to God's voice? 
Do you know on a regular basis what it means to hear from him? Do you? Yes, God speaks through Scripture, absolutely. And I believe that he wants to speak to us in a way where we go, whoa, that's really God speaking to me. And that's God's voice. But I also believe God wants to speak as we're going through life or as we're taking time for silence and just saying, what are you saying? I believe God wants to speak. I believe it's something that every Christian should be hearing. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. And so if, if, if you're here today and go, hmm, I don't know that I've ever understood what it means to hear God's voice. And if you're in that place, I'd like to su- suggest that, you know what, we, we as a church want to equip all of us to, to have that be a common experience in our lives. We, we say this stuff sometimes. We say, you know what, prayer is not meant to be a one-way street. <laughs> okay? Prayer is meant to be two ways. In fact, Nicky Gumbel in the Alpha videos he gives the example of, it's kind of like going to the doctor. He says, son, this is how we treat God. We go to the doctor and say, oh, my, my, my foot hurts, and I don't know what's going on there. And, oh, yeah, I've also got this pain in my back, and I don't know why I've been feeling really nauseous the, the last few weeks. You know, I don't know if there's anything you can do. Okay, see you later, doc. <laughs> and he said, that's what we do with God at different points. We, we come to him, and we tell him all the stuff, and then, okay, off to work. And he says, don't you want to stop and hear what the doctor has to say? (laughs) Don't you want to listen a bit? And so he really makes the point in our prayer times, we need to take time to listen. We need to take time to hear. And and really, uh, my hope is that all of us, again, would be taking regular times for prayer, but part of prayer is listening. If you encountered a demon while you were praying for someone, number one, would you recognize it? Number two, would you know what to do? And some of you go, what? I don't even know about that stuff at all. Um, Some of you would say, yeah, I've definitely encountered other spiritual beings as I've prayed for someone and seen people set free. Again, I would like to suggest all of us, if you're a Christian here today, all of us should be able to discern what's going on. All of us should know what to do as we encounter something like that. Am I being too hard on us? Do you have an effective prayer life? And I've already referred to that here. If you're a parent, are you able to parent your children well? effectively passing on your faith to them regularly. And um, I'm thankful for, we've got a parenting course going on right now. And, and I know that, that there's good stuff that happens in that context. And then uh, just a last question here. Are you serving others effectively using the gifts and abilities God's given you? Are you serving others effectively? using the gifts and abilities God's given you. And I believe, again, God's given us all something from, with which to serve others. And um, I'm just saying these things from the level of one of our commitments as a church is we want to be a church that equips and trains and helps each other really do, just as a sampling, the kinds of things that we talked about here today. This isn't meant to load on some kind of guilt or something on us this morning. Uh, This is meant to just be some questions to say, okay, how are we doing, guys? (laughs) Uh, If if we answer, no, I'm not so sure about that, well, then let's let's get involved in some of the either different kinds of small groups or courses that are available in terms of doing these things. And so we do different courses. We do VBI courses regularly, um, all with the goal of, of serving effectively. Number 10, my brother is never my enemy. Historically, there have been deep divisions in the body of Christ. We're all aware of the ongoing conflict in Northern Ireland, which in many ways is probably more political than anything, but also seems to be between Protestants and Catholics. Likewise, I've read books and articles 
where Christian leaders, authors, are being very critical of other parts of the body of Christ. The tragic thing is, as I've read some of those books, you realize how much is misquoted and misunderstood about what others are actually saying. And it really doesn't seem to come from an attitude of sincere love for the rest of the body of Christ. The challenge also is with those very people not to see them as our enemy, (laughs) but to also see them as our brother. The temptation within the body of Christ, for whatever reason, from the beginning has been to see our group or our church as the right group or the right church. In fact, it goes back to the disciples, believe it or not. (laughs) And I just uh, have one example of that. Mark chapter 9, 38, John comes to Jesus and he says, Teacher, we saw someone driving out demons in your name. We told him to stop because he's not one of us. (laughs) It's not just John. He says we, I don't know how many, 12, 6, 4. Some of them were together. Hey, you got to stop it. You're not one of the 12. You can't do this stuff. We only can do this stuff. Jesus' response is, do not stop him. For no one who does a miracle in my name can in the next moment say anything bad about me. For whoever is not against us is for us. Jesus prayed that his body would be one, just as he and the Father are one. Jesus loves his whole church. The church is called the bride of Christ. Jesus is coming back for his whole bride. And he loves his whole bride. We value the whole body of Christ. And I'm thankful in our community to know that there's other churches and pastors that have the same heart. This whole thing of let's, let's recognize we are all on the same team. <laughs> And, and my brother, no matter who he is, no matter what he's done, is never my enemy. And it's something that we want to continually call each other to as a church is to recognize, hey, let's, let's recognize how we are all working together uh, towards uh, common goals and desires. And so we're committed to getting rid of nervousness and suspicion between parts of the body of Christ. Number 11, this is one that, that I... I pray uh, at various points, in fact, quite regularly in my own life, and I had forgotten that it was actually something that John Wimber emphasized. Lord, keep me on a short leash. (laughs) When we realize the destructiveness of sin, and we realize how much God loves us as a father, we will gladly pray this prayer. And something I want to encourage you towards is to say, God, don't let me go off. <laughs> don't let me start wandering off over, you know, in a wrong direction in some way. We sang a song today <clears throat> about Psalm 23. Um, we sang it and went, oh yeah, now I can't recount exactly how it went. But uh, the context, Psalm 23, verse 1, the Lord is my shepherd, your rod and your staff comfort me. Now the staff, they didn't have rifles, okay? The the sorry, the, the rod, let me correct that. The rod was for for predators that came and tried to attack the flock. Okay, whack, you know. So in that way the rod was comfort. But the staff was used to continually pull the sheep back if they started wandering off too far. And David here says, your rod and your staff, they are such a huge comfort to me. And we sometimes go, man, I don't know if I want to pray something like that. What what might God do? That's the best thing that could happen is that God would pull us back and never let us start wandering off in the wrong direction. And so I just want to encourage you as well to to pray this prayer. It also means taking action in terms of, of confessing to friends Hey, here's what I'm struggling with right now. It's the whole thing of accountability. It's the whole thing of being honest with each other. Hey, I need you to be asking me how I'm doing in this area. Um, But what a great prayer. And then the last one uh, is we want to be a church that plants other churches. Matthew 28, um, 
Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations. Lost people matter to God, and they matter to us. And we don't want to just see people make a decision. We want to see people actually become disciples of Jesus. Uh, It was interesting to me um, when they were talking about this at the Lead On conference, uh, John and Eleanor, they said, so so where are the disciple-making factories? (laughs) They said, there is only one. It's the church. And so if we're actually doing this, if we're actually making disciples, guess what? We continue to need more churches. And um, Jesus, as, as I spoke about uh, a while back, Jesus emphasized, I will build my church. And so over the years, uh, this is one area that I would say we've, we've not done as much as I would have liked. We, we, have, we planted a vineyard church in Chilliwack. Uh, Vern and Sue were on staff with us, and Tom and Teresa Paul, who went down with them as well, and there was some people down there who were interested in doing that, and so that church came out of this one. Um, there was another church that Kirby Friesen uh, was on staff uh, with us here, and uh, with a group of people from here, uh, they started New Beginnings Church, and we blessed them to, to do that. Uh, there have been other churches that we've participated in financially, uh, in terms of uh, starting churches, and uh, it's it's a privilege to be able to do that. Um, we've had some other false starts. We we tried to plant a church in West Kelowna, and that one didn't happen. Um, but it's something that we want to continue to be committed to, because whenever a new church is started, guess what? More people come to know Jesus. And that's what this thing's all about. And um, just a a little bit of a note, there's actually going to be a new church starting in Vancouver, a vineyard church uh, in downtown Vancouver. Uh, Starting next year, a fellow by the name of Insu Kim. Uh, He's presently an associate pastor in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, Rich Nathan's Church, which is, I believe, the largest vineyard church in the States. Um, Many thousands of people. And uh, In Su Kim is his main associate, and he's actually moving from Columbus, Ohio, to Vancouver uh, to plant a church there uh, down the False Creek area. And so we're really excited about that, and we'll be involved in that in some way. And um, they've been in the planning stages for a while already. And so something we're very committed to as a church and and as a movement, and uh, we want to continue to to see God's kingdom advance, and this is one of the, the key ways. So this is a bit of a picture today of the things that we say are important to us as a church. talked about the six things from, from uh, uh, last week already. And, um, and then the six today, I'm just going to put these back up here again just as a reminder. Um, and what I want to ask us is, so back to the tune-up analogy, um, are, are there ways in which in your own life God needs to tweak some things? Uh, refocus you in some way. Refocus me. At least for me, it's helpful to look at these things again and go, yeah, that's the stuff that we really believe counts. And I um, want to continue to call us as a church to, hey, guys, let's let's put our energy to the things that really matter. And um, I don't have all 12 up here, but... Um, We're here for our community. We're here for the people around us. We're here to be used by God, uh, to reach people around us and to see them experience life through Jesus. And um, some of these talk about some of the things that affect us towards that as well. So let's stand together. do want to make room for if any of you had a prophetic word this morning. I'll jump down here.
Actually, I felt very prompted by the Holy Spirit to share the experience that um, you had challenged us to to do this week, and it came in the way that I didn't expect. And it was actually at the supermarket with a complete stranger, not the person I had in mind. My my evening up until the point that I had the opportunity to share with this fellow was I had dropped something I was going to return. I had to go out to the parking lot. My daughter had to go to the bathroom. It was like this, you know, quick pop into the store. And as I'm bagging my groceries, this this fellow that I haven't really met before start sharing with me that it was his 19-year-old daughter's birthday, and then he was sharing about his son who was struggling being overweight, and he was sharing how his marriage had split apart, and and I just, I felt totally comfortable, and I just said, you know, our church has an amazing youth group. You should, you know, get your son to come and and come to the youth group, and then I invited him to come to church and said, you know, we're a non-denominational church, and, and you know, we had chatted, and... and and I, you know, invited him. So it, it wasn't quite the way I wanted it to be. Um, you know, I had a person in mind and how I was going to say in mind, but I, I just want to share this and encouraging, you know, for us to be open to the Holy Spirit, to share God's love and share that our doors are open to everybody. And and I felt blessed by just having the courage to, to do that. So, and further to that, you say everybody can play. And I just, I want to encourage people when I first started coming to the church that, if don't leave today with a heavy heart if you have something that you want us to pray for you come up to the front and let us pray for you because i felt like saying that last weekend and i thought i want to come up because a lot of healing happens when you when you walk up to the front too so um god is good and he it's not in our own strength thanks rima I would venture to say probably most of us, if we had things planned in terms of how God was going to use us, were surprised by, by how he actually did. Right? A little bit different than how we had it planned. I was given a couple of other uh, words of knowledge. By the way, let me just say something about this. Um, the Bible talks about words of knowledge, and, and our understanding of that is at different points God will say Here's, sometimes as we're praying for a person, we'll suddenly know some things um, for the sake of helping the person, for the sake of praying for the person. Um, and sometimes God will identify certain sicknesses or ailments um, to, to, for one, get our attention, but also, as, as, a, as a general statement, I think we could say, because God's intention is to heal you of that. Um, and so I have a couple that were given to me here today. Uh, one of those is pain and discomfort in the left hip. And so if that's you, uh, I would encourage you to come up for prayer. Um, and secondly, a dislocated shoulder that has never really healed. And something weak. <laughs> Thought I could read this. Um, Anyways, continues to be weak. Um, so, again, um, dislocated shoulder uh, that's never really healed properly. And um, we'd love to pray for you. So, um, I just want to say again, sorry, Tanya. Hi, I don't know you guys, and I'm, I'm very nervous to talk in front of you. <laughs> but I actually went to youth group here with um, Hart and Lorraine and, and their daughter and you know, it's always good to come back. I live in Calgary now, and as I was coming through the mountains driving here, I had a word of knowledge for my mom, but I really felt God saying, it's for more people here than just my own mom. And it's that, you know, we hang on to our burdens. We hang on because we always try to do things in our own strength. And he reminded me that He's here for us. He wants us to lay those burdens at the foot of his cross, and he will find a way. And as soon as we remember that it's not in our own strength, it's not in our own power that we deal with everything that we're challenged with in life, that he will provide for us. He will get us through those hard times. And so I would encourage you that if you have something that's really bothering you and that's weighing heavy on you, to come up and just lay it down at the foot of his cross, and he will take care of everything for you. 
Thank you. Well, I wasn't going to share, but one of those words is for me in my shoulders, I think. Um, but um, I was reminded um, this week, I had some of my former students who were with us for a few days, and we were talking about some different things that happened when they were kids in my class. And we had a, a kid in the class who his grandpa was stage four, and we were, he, they were waiting, you know, kind of at the very end. And as a class, we continued to, we prayed for him and prayed for him and prayed for him. And I got, a, I got called out of my class with a phone call from his mom, the daughter of the man we were praying for, and she was just bawling. And as she's crying, I'm thinking, how do I go back into my class and tell them that he's gone? And she was calling from the hospital to tell me that he was completely healed. And so while they were waiting, God did, God completely healed the man. So I went back into the class and I'm freaking out, like so excited, totally spazzing. You guys, God healed him, he totally healed. And they're just sitting there looking at me. And I'm like, no, you guys don't get it. Like, he's well, he's, he's healed. And they're still just sitting there looking at me. And then one of the kids said, what did you think was going to happen? <laughs> And so the idea of praying with expectancy, like Hart was saying earlier, like just the idea that when we pray, what do we expect that God is going to do? And to be like little kids that way, you know, just that's what they believed God was going to do. What, what did I believe he was going to do? I don't know. Because I, when I heard her crying, that's what I thought. So just I think we need to to bring it to the Lord with expectancy and what do we believe that God is going to do? So if, if it's a prayer for you, you can stay up here and I'm going to have others come up. Any of you that identify with any of those words, come on up. I'm going to have one more from Ralph and then we're going to pray. And then uh, any of you that want prayer, uh, come on up and we'll pray for you. As you were sharing, Heart, the Lord gave to me this scripture, verse uh, 2 Chronicles uh, seven fourteen. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from, I'll paraphrase this, their ways, then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and will heal their land. Lord, thank you for your, your grace in our lives. Thank you for the reminders of the way that you, the ways that you heal and the ways that you restore. Thank you for the ways that we can look in our own lives and look at what you've done. And Lord, I pray that this week we would be ones who bring your life to those around us. I pray, Lord, that you would fill all of us with your Holy Spirit. And we would, we would be your instruments, we would be your conduits wherever we are this week. And I pray for the joy of walking with you. I pray for um, an excitement of knowing what it means to have that relationship with you throughout this week. And so I pray your blessing, your empowering for every one of us. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Those of you that would like prayer, come on up. We'd love to pray for you. And if we can have some of you come up and pray, um, and you can all do it.